Okay, so let's take a look at what's going to be on your test. So the first uh, chapter was over the sun, and I just have up here um, the anatomy of the sun. Know the three internal layers, and so here's a figure from your textbook. I know it's really small, but for instance, the three layers are internal layers are the core, the radiative zone, and the convection zone. Um, so, and then the three external layers would be the photosphere, the corona, and the chromosphere. And then, of course, we have solar wind blowing in all directions. Um, I have a note up here that the, with regard to um, what's happening um, in the, its core, uh, the flight of the energy, sorry, the flight of the energy from the core outward, um, I have in purple up here that the energy is only created in the core and that um, one of the videos we wa watched on the universe series talks about kind of this random walk. It takes 100,000 years for it to get from the core um, through the radiative zone or radiation zone. Um, then it's not so long to go through the convection zone and then when it's at the photosphere it takes um, about eight minutes to travel from the surface of the sun to the earth. I just think that is so cool. Um, Nuclear fusion in the sun's core, I brought in this excerpt from um, lecture slides. Um, when it says four protons, basically those are four, four um, hydrogen, four nuclei of hydrogen atoms. So four hydrogen and four protons, that's what you put in. And what you get out is a helium um, nucleus. Um, gamma rays that you get out are, are basically the energy. You have these miscellaneous subatomic particles, two positrons and neutrinos. Also, I made note that actually if you were to weigh the products, um, the helium and the gamma rays and the positrons and the neutrinos, they actually weigh about 0.7% less than what you put in. So actually that's where the whole Einstein's E um, is equal to mc squared. That's the missing mass that is converted to energy. Um, gravitational equilibrium, I think you had a homework question about this. Um, basically our sun is not expanding nor is it contracting because the force of, of gravity, inward force of gravity, is balanced by the outward force of the energy that it's creating in its core. Um, with that said, though, the next one actually is kind of to show you that the sun does wiggle a little bit. Basically, it has its own um, ongoing uh, thermostat, so if it cools down just slightly, then what happens is it contracts and it, and it heats up. So it kind of cancels it cooling down. If it gets too hot, what happens is it expands and it cools down. So it does kind of have this built-in thermostat. Um, neutrinos are kind of a missing subatomic particle that's created during nuclear fusion. Neutrinos, <coughs> excuse me, though are um, very elusive and hard to hard to track. Um, the sunspot cycle. I have a few things to say about that. Sunspot cycle occurs about every 11 years. And it's kind of a ramping up and then of solar activity and ramping down. And the, sun's, the sunspot cycle itself is created because uh, basically the sun's mag, um, line, magnetic lines, mag, magnetic field lines, get all kind of tangled as it rotates more quickly near the equator than it does at the poles. We call that differential rotation. But I have a little inset from your, um, a figure from your textbook to kind of show you the magnetic field coming out of one. Um, sunspot into another so that's kind of it definitely has a crazy magnetic field going on down there in blue I have listed um, when the Sun is what we say active you can imagine you're going to see all sorts of things including um, sunspots solar flares coronal holes uh, coronal mass ejections filaments and prominences and then on to the next chapter just basically um, an intro to stars in general so one of the things about stars, because we can talk about the star's luminosity, that's basically how much energy it's putting out per second. It's in units of watts. Then we talked about two brightness scales, the apparent brightness, what the, how the star appears actually, um, is related to um, its luminosity because it, it appears different brightnesses because of distance. So basically if we take the luminosity and divide it by 4 pi distance squared, we can get the apparent brightness. Um, the scale itself, actually, <coughs> excuse me, the way it goes is the smaller the M number, the smaller the apparent magnitude, the dimmer, it, the, the brighter it is, excuse me, the smaller the number, the brighter it is. Um, and a long time ago, they set up the scale so that actually the dimmest object you can see in, in dark skies um, with your naked eye is basically um, a plus six. Um, the other brightness scale is absolute magnitude. 
and absolute magnitude you have to it's it's a capital M and you have to what we say normalize for distance so what's done is to basically take the object the star or whatever and put it at um, 10 parsecs from us and then to look at how bright it is so everybody's on, on the same playing field so that's the absolute magnitude um, and absolute magnitude directly relates to luminosity so that works very well um, seven stellar spectral types that's the OBAF GKM the hottest is O, the M is the coolest. Um, binary stars, most stars actually have a companion, and they um, orbit a common center of mass. Um, the binary stars that you can literally see two stars, those are called visual binaries. If it's hard, to, you can't really see two stars, but um, if they, um, you can study their spectra or actually see that there is a kind of a, uh, the spectral lines will shift because of the Doppler effect. So, if you have radial motion, excuse me, um, the next type, or the third type of e, uh, binary is one where you can tell that there are two stars as one kind of scoots behind the other one or in front of the other one. That's called an eclipsing binary. Um, Hirschsprung russell diagrams, HR diagrams, um, we talked a lot about those. I kind of have one down here at the bottom here. Of course, the HR diagram, what's plotted along the x-axis is um, the temperature of the star. What's plotted along the y-axis is luminosity or absolute magnitude. Um, there are several groups that can be kind of picked out on the HR diagram. There are the main sequence I have kind of in one here. There are the um, various gas giants in group two and the, the white dwarfs in group three. Um, let's see, what's next? Uh, main sequence stars, these are stars that, um, that have just arrived, or just turned on. So main sequence stars are fusing hydrogen and helium in their cores. Um, and then on an HR diagram, the main sequence, of course, is kind of that diagonal from the upper left to the lower right. Um, and then on that main sequence, the upper right ones have the, are the more massive stars, and the lower left are the low mass stars. And then um, actually related to that is the next one, differences between low mass and high mass stars. So low mass stars tend to be red, <coughs> as their main sequence anyway. And the main sequence low mass stars tend to be red, a low luminosity, and um, they're generally cool. High mass stars are blue, um, they're high luminosity, and they're hot. And then we talked about um, clusters of stars. Um, since oftentimes stars are born in the same uh, molecular cloud, they can uh, develop this idea of a stellar nursery, a bunch of stars born at the same time. But we have open and globular clusters. And globular clusters are old, they kind of in the shape of a ball, and they're located in the halo part of the galaxy. And open clusters tend to be younger stars, they are kind of spread out, and they are located in the disk of the galaxy. Then the last one there says, actually, if you plot an entire family or an entire nursery of stars on, um, on an HR diagram, you can actually get a sense for how old they are because the more massive stars live their lives quickly and kind of peel off of the main sequence to become giants or whatever they're going to do. So that actually leads us to this idea of a turnoff point. And turnoff points are basically where the upper stars have left the main sequence so a turnoff par, uh, point I have here is where the most massive star left on the main sequence. The turnoff point is identified by the most massive star left on the main sequence. And you get a sense for how old the star cluster is. So for instance, if not very many of, um, if you have a very high turnoff point, um, you don't have very many stars that have pulled off of the main sequence, you have a young cluster. That's how that works. On to chapters 13 and 14, and I've explained in review sessions that um, actually 13 and 14 are all about how stars live their lives, so I th really think there are some terms listed in on my review sheet in chapter 14 that are actually occur in chapter 13, but a molecular cloud is actually just a big humongous nebula where lots of stars can be born um, at the same time. That's how you get your clusters. Um, let's see, protostar. Protostar is like a pre-star, um, and a protostar is um, a wannabe star, and a protostar will continue to collapse until it begins nuclear fusion in its core. 
So when it begins nuclear fusion, its core, of course, we call it a main sequence star. Um, main sequence stars, <laughs> um, that, that stage is when the, the stars are um, fusing hydrogen in their core to form helium. Main sequence stage is the longest stage for any star. Uh, planetary nebula. Um, we've talked about nebula a lot already this semester, so nebula is just a, a place in outer space that has um, an extra dose of material. A planetary nebula specifically is kind of when um, a low-mass star is kind of um, giving up its material. It's near the end of its life, and it is its material is kind of, um, it no longer has gravitational hold of its material, and it creates these kind of pretty-looking things called planetary nebula. Then I have here in green, remember that a planetary nebula, at the center of a planetary nebula, you can kind of figure on having a white dwarf there somewhere. Why do stars age differently? That's all about mass. So we talked that kind of the theme of it is that um, low mass stars um, uh, age more slowly, high mass stars age quicker. Uh, brown dwarf is a failed star. It's basically a star that was less than 8% or point. 0.08 solar masses, and it never had enough mass to basically begin thermonuclear fusion in its core. Helium fusion is an, um, the, the, the type of fusion that can occur after the main sequence. Specifically in helium fusion, helium um, atoms are fused together to create carbon. Uh, chapter 14, we talked about different sort of um, binary situations where a star has a companion. Um, in the case of a white dwarf supernova, the white dwarf, of course, is a retired star, and it has a, um, a companion that is dumping material on it. And specifically, the material that gets dumped on that retired star gives it enough mass, kind of pushing the Chandrasekhar limit, and that's a term coming up, about 1.4 solar masses. So actually, it begins nuclear fusion in its core, and it wasn't expecting that, so it doesn't kind of have the rest of the mechanics to go ahead and, and, and keep that fusion going so it blows itself up. So that's a white dwarf supernova. A super or a massive star supernova is something I think we talked about um, maybe earlier in the chap earlier in this unit too. Um, as a massive star ends its life, um, it the last thing to fuse is basically silicon fusing into form iron. And when iron has been formed in the core of these massive stars, iron cannot fuse. And so basically it's a dead end to the star. And so it's going to blow itself up. So that's a massive star supernova. Um, a red giant, that actually um, is a star that has left the main sequence. It's done fusing hydrogen in its core. Um, I think that's all I have here. Uh, white dwarf is a retired star, retired relatively low mass star. Remember, anything like eight solar masses um, and lighter is going to basically create this planetary nebula and a white dwarf. Um, white dwarfs would be, you expect to be kind of an orb of carbon because that's what they fuse helium to form carbon. Chandrasekhar limit, um, like I said, is a, uh, approximately 1.4 times the mass of our sun. And at the Chandrasekhar limit for a white dwarf, uh, basically... Um, uh, uh, normal degeneracy pressure um, is uh, compromised. So an accretion disk happens when basically matter from a swollen giant is, is dumping on another object. That other object could be a white dwarf, it could be a neutron star, or it could be a black hole. But that accretion disk is kind of that matter that's queuing up to fall in towards the object. Um, the thing about accretion disks are that they create friction, so they do glow slash create a lot of energy. They can actually create enough energy to begin nuclear fusion on them. Speaking of, um, actually in the situation of a nova, um, nova occur because of a, um, we have a retired white dwarf, and it has a companion that's dumping on it, like a swollen giant, and that actually um, material, fresh hydrogen, gets dumped on the surface of a white dwarf. <coughs> and then the white dwarf um, has conditions such that it can begin nuclear fusion just of the fresh hydrogen that it got dumped on. Now, basically, the white dwarf itself stays intact, so um, NOVA actually can reoccur. Gravitational redshift actually have a couple of things, but gravitational redshift is where the 
the intense gravity of a black hole or a neutron star or white dwarf, the intense gravity basically creates a type of kind of gravitational well. So objects that are near there and they're emitting light, um, in order to escape the gravity, they have to lose some of their energy. So, and, and as they, as they uh, photons lose their energy to creep out of that gravitational well, they are shifted to longer wavelength colors like red. So um, this was an example we talked about in um, in this chapter. Remember we had the spacecraft uh, that had the blue light, excuse me, the blue clock, uh, 50 seconds on it, and then the spacecraft that had the red clock, 15 seconds. And the point here with the gravitational redshift is that as the, um, the clock is sent closer to the event horizon, or I should say the spaceship that has the clock on it, is sent closer to the, to the um, event horizon, then as those um, blue photons want to climb out and go in our direction, they actually lose some of their energy, so they're shifted to the longer color wavelengths. That's gravitational redshift. Um, neutron star um, is uh, one possibility when a massive star uh, ends its life in a supernova. Neutron stars are basically the remnant of the star where basically pressure um, has been such that the uh, electron degeneracy fails. So um, electrons and protons combine to form neutrons. So basically you have an object that's basically neutron soup. And related to a, um, a neutron star is a pulsar. So pulsars are these kind of, um, these very regular signals that we get from actually a neutron star. And I like this figure from your textbook um, up here that says what's happening. Basically, the rotational axis is not, uh, doesn't coincide with the axis of its magnetic field. So you, its magnetic field is kind of squirting out energy. So as the um, neutron star rotates, then this beam of energy swings around. So as this beam, um, as we come into the um, crosshairs of this beam, we get a blip, 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 blip. So that's a pulsar, indicating the presence of a neutron star. So the formation of a stellar black hole, basically um, the, neutron, um, the neutron degeneracy pressure that held up a neutron star fails. So neutron, or so subatomic particles basically fall in on top of themselves. Um, uh, stellar, any sort of black hole is basically a um, matter is so dense that it creates a hole in the fabric of space and time. Um, the anatomy of a black hole kind of looks like this. So anatomy of black hole, we have the thing in the center, the singularity. Then we have kind of the region that's affected, um, outlined by the event horizon. The distance from the point of singularity out to the event horizon is called the Schwarzschild radius. Effects of a black hole, now I only emphasize the effect of time, um, so don't worry about length and mass. But um, we said time, the, the, if you sent a probe closer to the event horizon, remember we said that not only would you get a gravitational redshift, but also from our perspective, time would slow down as we, as, as from our perspective, their time would slow down. So that's why on the figure up here, um, although um, the, the spaceship we're on shows 50 seconds, the spaceship that is um, approaching the event horizon is showing 15 seconds, so time slowing down, that's time dilation. Then last but not least, um, I went ahead and gave you sort of an outline of the stages of the low mass and the high mass stars. I know that there are some kind of, there's a low, low mass star that creates a red dwarf. But just think kind of general, uh, aside from red dwarfs, we have low mass stars, eight solar masses and less. And they start with a protostar. They end up uh, joining the main sequence, you know, uh, fusing hydrogen and a cordiform helium. Then it goes in the giant stage. Um, when it's done with that, it's done. Basically, it's got a core now that hydrogen is uh, fused to form carbon. Um, it's going to give us a planetary nebula and ultimately a white dwarf. Then the high mass stars, more massive than eight solar masses, have a very similar beginning. We can even just kind of generally call it a giant stage as they leave the main sequence. But just very much in general, they end up fusing heavier and heavier elements um, in their core. And then when they end up fusing silicon to form iron, of course, that's the, that's the end. Um, so high mass stars actually blow up 
in a supernova event. And then what they leave behind is actually the little corpse of the star is either going to be a neutron star or a black hole.